Our next speaker is Jesse Andrewartha. He comes to us live from Vancouver, where he specializes in analog filmmaking and special effects, exploring the interaction of humankind in the physical world. A lot to cover in a short period of time. So I think we'll just pass it over to him right now. So first of all, uh, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'd like to express my gratitude to the Biocommunications Association, uh, Daniel Edwards and uh, James Hayden and uh, Gail Spring for inviting me to um, present this work today. My interest in uranium began when I was 11 years old. I became entranced by the story of the discovery of radioactivity, which rapidly evolved into an, uh, an obsession with nuclear history. I read and watched everything I could get my hands on, and my passion for nuclear history has never waned. And transmutations represents that passion. I'm delighted to share this project with you today. So here's where the journey begins. This is an auto radiogram. It's a photographic image formed from the radiation emitted by its subject. A carbon polished uh, specimen of uranium ore from the C Group mines, Emory County, Utah, mined during the uranium boom of the mid 20th century. Here's the rock that created this image. You can see the fascinating structure of the uranium in the rock. The uranium in this ore was formed in aqueous solutions that moved through and concentrated in rock millions of years ago, resulting in those incredible organic shapes and forms. And as you can, as you can see, it's quite radioactive. But how is the image actually formed? So a little segue, and some of you may already know this next bit, but let's just do a little bit of physics. So nuclear radiation that we encounter from radioactive minerals consists of three different types of rays, alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha is helium nuclei, and because of its mass, can only travel a few centimeters in air and is stopped by a sheet of paper. Beta radiation is electrons, which can travel a few feet in air or through a thin sheet of foil. Gamma radiation is high energy photons of light, which can penetrate thick concrete and lead. So, what I've done in each of these images is laid a cut and polished piece of uranium ore on a sheet of photographic film in complete darkness so that it's in contact with the film surface. The film surface consists of uh, light-sensitive silver salts, silver halide, suspended in layers of gelatin. Each of these forms of radiation expose film as though they are visible light. So over the course of hours or days, the radiation exposes the silver halide. This film is then developed normally, providing a visible image of the radiation emanating from the ore. I printed the resulting autoradiograms in uranotype an historical alternative process using light-sensitive urinal salts. I maintained a start to finish analog process, which involved hand-coating the platinum rag with urinal salts. The process is incredibly slow and requires an exposure more than double that necessary for a properly exposed, a properly exposed palladium print. I enlarged the 4x5 negative to Ilford 16-inch by 20-inch fiber-based paper. This uh, print was then used to create an ultra-large format internegative using an actor repro master. It is this internegative that is then used to expose the uranotype emulsion in the new arc UV printer. The latent image is developed in potassium ferrocyanide, which creates the characteristic deep ox blood image in uranium ferrocyanide in insoluble pigment. The final print is then washed and then dried. So here it goes into the developer. See it intensifying, and there's the final image. So these prints represent um, the culmination of 20 years, 20 years of research and preparation. But when I showed this image to friends, I got some unexpected comments. It looks like bacon, or that's cool, but what is it? Or that's uranium. I thought uranium was man-made. I realized that a lot of folks don't have any context, context for these materials that it's not, not even widely understood that uranium is a metal that's mined from the ground. Uranium's history with this as a resource is comparatively short. It elevated to strategic importance in 1938, just 84 years ago. In that time, the world has been completely changed by it. Even though concepts like nuclear power, the arms race, the Cold War, nuclear proliferation, and uranium are widely known in our societies, there's an entire history of resource extraction, environmental, and social impact that's missing from the discussion. I created transmutations to help close the circle. 
I set out with the idea that if I could visit and photograph the mines where my samples originated and then show these locations, the people and the communities they impacted alongside those samples, an exhibition could show the connection between uranium and the regions and communities they're extracted from. These locations would be printed in palladiotype, a reflection of the longevity of their impact. When I was discussing my project with possible participants, I would draw a clear line in the sand and ask whether I'm an environmentalist or pro nuclear. I want to make clear that the project aimed not to take any side in this discussion. This is not to avoid any hard conversations, but to fully reveal the lives and lands entangled with uranium. Uranium is a complex subject and often represents a dichotomy, and the stories and experiences that surround it are just as complex. Now, I'll go through a little more physics again, which may be, again may be familiar to some of you. As you already know, uranium is radioactive, which means it's unstable emitting energy in the form of radiation and decaying or transmuting into different elements as it tries to become stable lead. Uranium has an extremely long half-life of 4.6 billion years and therefore has a very low radioactivity. When uranium finally decays, it proceeds through a series of short-lived, much more radioactive elements until it reaches stable lead. So the ore that comes from the ground isn't just uranium, it's a cocktail of radioactive elements, the daughters of uranium. In fact, uranium is only a small fraction of the radioactivity in the ore. If you take out uranium, three quarters of the radioactivity remains. One of those is radium. The nuclear industry began with radium. The discovery of radium by the Curies in 1898 heralded the beginning of the new atomic age. When it was first isolated, it took up to 15 tons of uranium ore to refine one gram of radium. It has a half-life of 1600 years, and is more than a million times more radioactive than uranium. This is purified radium chloride after separation and drying. At that level, it kills living tissue, and as soon as it was discovered that it could be used to shrink cancerous tumors, it became the most sought-after element on Earth. Belgium possessed the majority of the world's sources of uranium ore that was refined to extract radium. Because it was such a labor-intensive process, at its peak, radium was worth more than $1 million per gram. First source of uh, first major source of radium outside of Europe in the Belgian Congo was a port radium discovered by Gilbert Labine on the shores of Great Bear Lake in 1930. This is one of the locations I photographed. Port radium was the starting point for what became known as the Highway of the Atom. This is a map drawn for the February 1934 edition of Fortune magazine, showing a journey of the ore would take from the mines as it was transported by air and barge down to Port Hope, where it would be refined into radium salts. The role of El Dorado in Port Radium can't be understated. It was the richest uranium mine outside of Bohemia and the Congo. When El Dorado first began operations, radium was worth more than a million dollars per gram, and it was only because of this price that the ore could still be profitable, despite the remoteness of the mine and the complexity and logistics. But El Dorado eliminated the stranglehold Europe had on the radium market. It had such an impact that a price war began between the two factions and the cost of radium plummeted over 90%. The Belgians could withstand or even drive this competition, but it had a devastating impact on poor radium. Faced with massive losses, coupled with the cost of mining and transporting ore from the Arctic Circle, the company closed down the mine in 1938. Robert Botwell, author of the book El Dorado, wrote of the mine's failure, quote, it wasn't that the Labines ran the mine poorly, it's that they ran a mine at all. But then the rush for the atomic bomb began and pulled Port Radium back into the world stage. The mine was nationalized by the Dominion of Canada in 1941 to produce uranium for the Manhattan Project, and the metal used in the fission bomb that destroyed Hiroshima was fashioned from uranium refined at Port Radium. Uranium was mined there until 1956, but the site continued silver mining right up until the 1980s. At one time, Port Radium was considered a contender for the capital of the Northwest Territories. 350 people lived there. There was an RCMP station, a post office. It even had a curling club. Here's what it looks like now. You can see all those buildings are cleared. Cleanup by the federal government was completed in 2012, with all traces of buildings removed. All areas of radioactivity greater than two microsieverts were covered with waste rock, and all tailings covered and stabilized. Here's the only remnant, a plate commemorating all that happened there. 
When radiation, x-rays and radium entered the public consciousness at the dawn of the 20th century, no one understood how it worked. In his book, Radiation Evangelists, author Jeffrey Womack describes a fledgling radiation therapy industry that began just a few years later, in which medical practitioners had to further contend with the fact that they didn't understand how it interacted with the human body, and that these radiations are undetectable by human senses. Invariably, these discussions turned into exercises of metaphorical thinking. He writes, the concept of radium as Helios, the sun, was promulgated not only as a way to describe the energy emanating from a source, but also to describe modalities of treatment. This idea of bringing light inside the body, macro politics of our recent past, but at the turn of the 20th century, radioactive materials were often depicted as many suns. It was a central tenet of radiation quackery to evoke bringing sunlight inside the body with radioactive materials. Even after several highly publicized cases of radium illnesses and deaths in the 1920s and 30s, this association of radium with life-giving sunlight proved incredibly difficult to overcome. While it was well known by the 1930s that radiation was hazardous, the remnants of the idea of radium as Helios would lead to a temperament of respect for the materials that poor radium mined and concentrated and led defense to inaction on the issues of health and safety for poor radium workers. This is the point that Gilbert Levine entered in 1930. Within seven years, hundreds of thousands of tons of uranium tailings containing up to 80% of the original radioactivity had been dumped into this channel. Workplace health and safety just wasn't a thing. Eldorado operated on a shoestring budget. Marcel Pochon, who learned our radium fractionation with Marie Curie and was the director of Eldorado's radium laboratory, had it written into his contract that he would be continued to be paid even if he fell ill to radium poisoning. Workers had no such contracts and routinely worked with no protection. Technicians refining radium weren't even issued gloves until seven years after operations began, and radiation safety in the refinery wasn't taken seriously until 1947, when the first major investment in worker radiation protection was made. 15 years after the mine first opened. Workers in the poor radium mine uh, worked often with uh, no forced ventilation until the 1940s, relying on natural airflow for air exchange. Even then, equipment in the mine would freeze in the Arctic temperatures, requiring heating that necessitated turning off ventilation for extended periods of time. In these phases, helium gas, which forms from alpha radiation that acquires an electron to become a helium atom, would accumulate in the rises and mop off the mine, forcing out the oxygen. But it was not only helium accumulating in these mines, it was the most insidious danger uranium miners faced, radon. Remember that decay series? You'll see after radium, there's radon-222 and a series of ultra-short-lived daughters. Those are known as radon progeny, and they're what make radon so deadly. Radon itself is inert and enters and exits the lungs largely with no effect. But the progeny increase in concentration in an unventilated mine and can reach equilibrium in there with the radon. And unlike radon, they're charged and sticky, adhering to any surface. So the real danger is less from radon than it is those sticky radon daughters remaining in the lungs, exposing the tissues to radiation. The amount of radioactivity in the air was measured in working levels. A unit that describes 130,000 mega electron volts of alpha radiation energy deposited in the lung per liter of air from radon daughters, or roughly 3,700 nuclear disintegrations per second per cubic meter at full equilibrium. The current limit for uranium miners is 0.3 working levels or less. Miners during the uranium boom frequently worked in environments with 20 to 40 working levels, and exposures over 100 working levels weren't uncommon. Miners experienced up to six times the lung cancer over normal populations, and if you smoked, the risk was multiplied even further. Here's a worker standing next to sacks of concentrated uranium ore at Fort Radium. What's not well documented is the experience of the First Nations people of the region, the Satu Dene, who traded with miners and were given jobs transporting ore concentrates. But the Dene weren't told what they were mining, nor were they given any protection. Workers slept on the sacks of ore as they plied the highway up the atom. Families in Delaney, where many of the Dene lived, used the ore sacks in their homes. While there are few available records, the Dene suffered illness and death, 
and Delaney became colloquially known as the village of widows. The Dene eventually learned about their role in the development of the bomb, and then in the 1990s, a delegation of Satu Dene or workers traveled to Hiroshima to apologize for their actions. The apology was a remarkable act, even though they, they themselves suffered and weren't told what they were transporting. David L. Eng wrote in his book, Reparations in the Human of this event, quote, dispossessed of their land through a long history of colonial settlement, targeted by enormous state violence and neglect, and suffering from unspeakable personal loss and long-term environmental devastation, the Satu Dene nonetheless apologize. They voluntarily assume the mantle of perpetrator and thus take responsibility for their role in the atomic disaster for a violence that claimed them as much as any other. After the bombing of Hiroshima and the conclusion of the Second World War, uranium was in demand for weapons and nuclear power. A, a new world was promised. Coal, the main source of power at the time, has an energy density of 25 megajoules per kilogram. In contrast, uranium has an energy density of 83 million megajoules per kilogram, and the dawn of atomic age was eliminated by uranium. After poor radium, discoveries on the shores of Athabasca Lake, Saskatchewan, led to a town that was built around the Beaver Lodge district mines, Uranium City. El Dorado, the company that operated Port Radium, also operated Beaver Lodge. The operation consisted of a number of different properties and mines, which were established to mine all bodies and made up deposits in this area, centered along the St. Louis Fault that runs through the district. One of the samples in the Uranotype series comes from the Bay East mines. In places like Uranium City, the remnants of uranium exploration and mining are being cleaned up. The East mine itself was closed down in 1982 and is now in a state of monitoring by the Cameco Corporation, the modern incarnation of the El Dorado Company. Here you can see the multi-ton stainless steel caps that have been bolted down over the rises that once led to underground workings. As with Port Radium, tailings and mine sites are covered with rock and monitored, but uranium would be found throughout Canada and a number of important mines were established across the Dominion, which continues to this day. Saskatchewan actually continues to contribute 30% of the world's uranium. Up in the US, after the Second World War, the newly established Atomic Energy Commission was eager to develop domestic uranium reserves and offered a guaranteed price per pound, as well as significant financial assistance to develop proven deposits. This incentive started a uranium boom that would transform the nation. 70 years later, there are some 15,000 abandoned uranium mines on the Colorado Plateau, an area covering roughly 336,000 square kilometers within western Colorado, northwest New Mexico, southern and eastern Utah, and northern Arizona. <clears throat> and it all began with this mine, the Mivita. Until that point, there'd been uranium mining in the region, but the ore contained mainly carnotite, a bright yellow, low purity ore of uranium, typically about 4% which was mined on a small scale for vanadium between 1917 and 1941. Uranium mining began in earnest after the Second World War, but it was the Mavita mine that started the uranium rush. The uraninite that came from Mavita was high grade ore, up to 80% uranium oxide, and at 21 meters thick by 24 kilometers long. It's recognized as one of the most important deposits of any kind found during the last century. Its discovery caused a massive influx of prospectors that transformed towns like Moab, Landing, and Monticello. Here's a miner that we met on our travels, Kevin Shumway. The Shumway family are integral to the mining history of Utah, and members of his family have worked or owned some of the most famous mines in the region. Uranium mining transformed the fortunes of his family, and he is a fourth generation of miners, beginning with his great-grandfather. Kevin himself started mining when he was a child, becoming full-time in his teen years. When he first started, ore cars were pulled by horse. Here he is on, on a reclaimed site where the photograph was taken with his horse. He lights up when prompted to talk about mining, and he's deeply proud of his career and his family's accomplishments. It became clear how much he misses that phase of his life, and there's endless incredible stories of his time with family as they dug for riches. He would always say, you're always three, three feet from a million dollars. He would repeatedly describe mining trees. Eventually, I asked him if this was a mining term, and he replied, no, we mine trees. And then he showed us this. 
You look at a big tree, a big pine tree, more, most of the limbs are on top, right? So that's the same as this, the, 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 lots of limbs this way. And usually in the butt, there's usually one great big root that goes a long way, that's probably the tap root. So see that there wasn't as many roots here. And I'm wondering if, I'm pretty sure that this is the last shot I, I shot. But if you look at this tree, you can see the capping. This is the bark. Comes all the way up here. That tree comes all the way up here like that. And it goes clear down into there. That tree's, I think, I think Kyle came and shot this out of here. I think I left right here. Maybe not, maybe it's just down here, but still that, that thing, that, that tree still what, 10 feet wide? 10 feet wide, eight, nine feet wide. And so can you see it though, how it's shaped? Right here, it was just a great big round tree about six feet round, this whole thing, just like this. Yeah. Now it's not like that. It's starting to buck. The mining has taken its toll. As a small family-based operation, they got by with minimal protection they could decades. Kevin and his brother wore respirators, which he clear credits with extending their lives. But as workplace health laws tightened in the 70s, they frequently butted up more against more and more stringent regulations that they struggled to meet. Ten working levels. Henry Maurer was the inspector. You were good. But we worked in mine where his machine only went to 20 working levels. And it was, I mean, that, this is 50, 45 years ago, 40 years ago. So I'm sure it's obsolete. But they just add a tube on it and they just put a filter in and it tests the air. Maybe they still do it the same way, an air tester. I think that's, that's basically exactly the same way. Yeah. And so they'd, they'd test the air. And sometimes it'd go right off the scale at 20 working levels. And it'd say, you guys. And I'd say, we're about to break through and get a wind tunnel, Henry. So they'd give us two weeks. Gradually, Kevin's relatives succumbed to the effects of dust and radon. Here he is describing that. The thing that killed my dad and all them is they, they worked in the mines that had uh, pitch blend, you know, 90% uranium, the, the, the hot ones. So all the people that worked in the in the real hot mines, the, the payday, the, 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 the Happy Jack, the My Vita, they're all dead. They killed them all quick because they were in a lot more radon. I mean, a lot of hotter mines, that pitch blend. Eventually the dust took sorry. Eventually the radon dust took a toll on his health too. A stage four cancer survivor, he now suffers from pulmonary fibrosis. Years of inhaling rock dust that remain in his lung and scar tissues over time, causing a progressive terminal decline. Yet Kevin describes the twenty five to thirty years he mine as the happiest and best times of his life. Next we went to the happy jack. This is the owner staring into the abyss. He actually uses the mine as a storage space. So when we photographed inside the mine, we had to photograph around its boxes and stuff. But it was very active in there, so we kept close to the entrance. You'll see the frame structure in this image that was used to block off access further into the mine. And you can see the remnants of the material used to do that. In this case, the radon levels deep within the mine would reach over 2,000 working levels. We never went to those areas. But in this spot where this photograph was taken, we were receiving the equivalent of one chest, chest X-ray per hour of gamma radiation, and that was with protective gear. Miners would endure hazardous working conditions, mining in these areas with up to 40 working levels for weeks and years on end. Can you imagine what the miners went through being in that environment for eight to 12 hours a day? To illustrate the point further, here's a picture of one of the pillars in color taken by my terrible magic fella. You can't see much, it looks pretty brown and drab, but if you look in ultraviolet, you can see the uranium in the rock. For the First Nations, these mines were blight and danger. As miners, Navajo were given the most hazardous work, often sent into the mine immediately after dynamite blasts, mucker, or even before the radioactive dust settled. Equipment in the mines with Navajo were poorly kept, and ventilation was often inoperable or inadequate. Navajo weren't provided health care, nor were records kept. Federal regulations for ventilation came nearly 20 years after the need was clear. 
and only when many miners were obviously sick and dying. Even in 2002, revisions proposed by NIOSH had not been fully implemented. Earlier efforts at educating mine owners and state officials and notification of miners were quite hard at best. Compensation for those who were sick or dying only came another 20 years later, after hundreds had already died. And the Navajo and other First Nations now have to deal with unremediated mines on the land. We met several indigenous activists leading to fight, uh, leading the fight to clean up the mines and will stop uranium mining on their land. This is Clee Benali. Clee is the name that has spearheaded a number of initiatives and organizations to eliminate uranium mining. I could discuss his experiences and work, but I want to leave it to him in his own words. This is an excerpt from his full interview featured in my film, Transmutations. This is the reality that we face growing up here. We see this every day. There are so many of our relatives that can't drink water. Uh, they've had to move from their houses because of the radioactive pollution. Some of their houses were built from radioactive materials or their houses were built right next to mill sites. You know, we have um, abandoned uranium mines in the backyards of people's houses where their children play to this day. Um, and so you cannot you know, be ignorant of the issue. It, you might become numb to it, um, but I refuse to resign uh, to despair. And that's why I take action. And really, it's just been um, for me about uh, cleaning up the mess that my relatives left um, because they worked at the mines, they were exploited, they worked to feed their families. Um, but it's been at such a significant cost. And it's a cost and it's a price that many of us bear and people don't see. And so this has been the challenge for not only my work, but the work of people like Tommy Rock, people like Leona Morgan, people like Charmaine Whiteface, and so many others who are taking a stand to say, let's leave uranium in the ground, no more weapons, no more waste. If we want a future for our coming generations, then we have to act now and make sure that we have no more uranium mining. Here is an image of one of the Terrings piles in the Nakahu Nation. You can see that less than 400 meters away is residential housing. This is repeated throughout the Navajo Nation. There's even three abandoned uranium mines in Monument Valley, where you look out from the visitor center. The transmutations. Let's set out to change other people's understanding of uranium and our connection to materials. But through this journey, I found my own views and understanding challenged. It's difficult to convey the sense of power and dread that's placed upon us. All extractive resources for power generation impact human health. As we face down the global impact of fossil fuels, we have to contend with the fact that coal itself contributes to the deaths of an estimated 4 million people per year, which is double even the worst estimates for all potential deaths predicted through uranium extraction, nuclear power, and nuclear accidents since the beginning of the atomic age. Uranium just holds a unique place in the public consciousness because it's radioactive. It's an unseen danger. Envisioned in the yellow trade oil and the mushroom cloud, issues brought up by the questions around resource extraction are complex, as are the pathway solutions, and founded by the eternal problem that we as humans just aren't that great at assessing or managing risk. We all benefit from a resource extraction. This presentation itself wouldn't be possible without it. The metals, the materials, the power, I can't dismiss my own role in the system, but I hope that this work goes some way to help people understand how these materials come about, how they manifest, and about how all of our actions and interactions with materials impact the world. Thank you for your time.